Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, How We Can See ME-CFS Inflammation in the Brain with standout ME-CFS researcher, Dr. Jared Younger. We're incredibly excited to be hosting Dr. Younger today, but before we begin, I'd like to go through some housekeeping slides. If you have a question, you can use the Q&A function, which you can see on your screen there. And if you'd like to enable captions, use the show subtitle button to enable that assistive technology. I also wanted to thank everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. Uh, we've shared them with Dr. Younger and will hopefully address as many as possible time permitting. Our webinars are recorded and will be available soon after the completion of this webinar. You can find all our video content at youtube.com slash solve CFS. Please also note that we cannot provide medical advice. These webinars are for informational and educational purposes only. I'm now pleased to turn it over to Solve MACEO Ovid Amate to introduce today's speaker. Thank you very much. And it really is uh, a pleasure uh, to have uh, Dr. Younger with us today. I was really uh, looking forward uh, to, uh, to this presentation. Um, Dr. Younger uh, is the director of the uh, Neuroinflammation, Pain, and Fatigue Laboratory at the University of Alabama uh, at Birmingham, also known as UAB. Uh, he received his doctorate in experimental health psychology back in 2003 from the University of Tennessee and completed his postdoctoral studies uh, at Arizona State at Stanford University as well. Um, Dr. Younger joined the Stanford faculty in 2009, and in 2014, he moved to uh, the University of, of Alabama, where he is, uh, where he's at right now. And he is a professor of, uh, in psychology, anesthesiology, and rheumatology. And Dr. Younger's work focuses, as many of you know, on using neuroimaging, immunological, and pharmaceutical scientific approaches to better understand brain inflammation. Next slide, please. Um, I'm also very, very uh, uh, proud to say that uh, Dr. Younger was one of the first recipients of, of SOLVE's uh, grant uh, program, also known as the Ramsey Award. Um, and that really uh, was used by Dr. Younger to show that brain temperature is actually elevated in MECFS and that this increased temperature is a sign of brain inflammation. Uh, and these findings are really now the, basic, the basis for uh, additional work uh, that Dr. Younger is doing uh, that he will be uh, sharing uh, with us today. So Dr. Younger, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to have you with us and we're really looking forward to, uh, to your presentation. Great, thank you very much. Let me share the screen and we'll get started. We should be good. Great. Okay. So yeah, I'm a, a professor, a full-time scientist. That is all I do here. I rarely teach. I'm basically 100% trying to do research. That's what our lab is about. We focus primarily on MECFS. That's where most of our funding is centered. Uh, our second um, focus area is fibromyalgia, and our third is Gulf War illness. So those are the three that we spend most of our time on. Uh, I do neuroimaging work. So a lot of the projects we're running are brain imaging studies of different types. Some of them are MRI, some are PET, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. We do a lot of immunology work. So we do blood draws and look at different pro-inflammatory cytokines, things like that. And we do clinical trials. So we're testing new pharmaceuticals and testing botanicals and different treatments that we think will actually help these uh, conditions. So we're trying to solve these medical conditions and come up with the treatments that will end them. But in this talk today, I'm gonna to focus mainly on the neuroimaging. I'm gonna to touch on some clinical trials and a few other things, but this is really a neuroimaging talk. And I wanna particularly focus my time on how do we visualize MECFS? So it's a tangible thing that we can actually see and talk about. I think it's important to progressing the field that we have something that we can look at when we're talking about MECFS. I'm gonna to try to wrap this up in about 40 minutes and save some time for questions and discussions. I do need to do a couple little intro slides before I start showing data and getting into it. Uh, just, this is my disclosure slide. I have no conflicts of interest. I will be talking about off-label use of some pharmaceuticals, including some really, really off-label use because some of the stuff is really experimental. And this work is funded by two federal agencies, NIH and DOD, and then a few nonprofit organizations, Solve ME, of course, and then American Fibromyalgia Syndrome Association, Rheumatology Research Foundation, and ME Research UK. 
here's my outline. I'm gonna give a very general description first, what I mean when I say, how can we see MECFS in the brain? What's the effort there? And I'm gonna give three different examples of projects that we're working in the lab right now. The first one is brain temperature, which you just heard about a little bit. And I'm gonna give you some updates on that. Then we have leukocyte tracking, which is really cool. First time done in people uh, very recently, and that's tracking immune cells as they may enter the brain and cause all sorts of problems because they're not supposed to be there. And now we have an ability to actually see those cells infiltrating places they should not be. And then we're talking about microglia tagging, which is identifying microglia cells when they've adopted a pathological state. So we can actually, these are three different ways to show in an individual if their brain is inflamed and behind their MECFS symptoms. I'm gonna talk a little bit about clinical trials because we need more clinical trials. And so I'm just gonna make a push and it's the ultimate goal of all this anyway. All this goes into clinical trials. Even the imaging is designed to support clinical trials. So I do need to talk about that a little bit and kind of give you my opinions on where we need to go with clinical trials, what we need to emphasize, and then I will conclude. So ultimate goal, real quick, before I start getting into the data, the ultimate goal is to develop the absolute best treatments possible for MECFS. It is a shame, as I'm sure everyone knows, that there are no FDA approved treatments for MECFS. And more so, I checked up to date this morning, and up to date is kind of the physician's Bible right now. So if a primary care physician had an MECFS participant or a patient, and they wanted to see what to do, they would go to up to date and look at the recommendations. And I just checked that again this morning and the recommendations have no treatments whatsoever recommended for MECFS. There are no, there's no guidance for MECFS. What it does have is treat the symptoms. It's like if your MECFS patient has sleep, try to take care of sleep. If they have cognitive issues, send them to a neuropsychologist. If they have you know, just fatigue, try a stimulant or try exercise. Nothing is actually targeting MECFS. And so, you know, that's not a critique of up to date and that's not a critique of the medical community. It's just the fact that there has been no treatment that's gotten enough results to be recommended. So there's really nothing that's met that bar. And that's why there are no specific treatments offered by the kind of the physician's handbook. So we have to get treatments in the hands of clinicians. And particularly we have to get treatments in the hand of primary care physicians because there's not enough specialists that deal with this. So that's what I'm trying to do, treatments that can be used by any physician, any clinician to, to solve this. So that's the goal. I'm not gonna go into the specifics of what I think is wrong. I'm just gonna give a really quick, maybe 40 second overview. So we're all on the same page. And the quick story behind everything I'm presenting today is individuals with MECFS have low level inflammation, low level chronic inflammation in the brain. That's the quick story. And I call it low level because it's not immediately threatening to your life. There are levels of brain inflammation that are deadly and could kill someone in a few days. Bacterial meningitis is a really good example of brain inflammation that is very, very dangerous. And so I do think MECFS is low level, but that's just to distinguish it from a acute medical emergency. But in terms of disrupting life, even though I call it low level inflammation, it still causes significant and catastrophic um, effects on fatigue and cognitive disruption and malaise or all uh, kind of endpoints or things that are affected by that. So it's a very serious problem. That's what I think is happening. It's basically inflammation. It's the thing that's guided me. It's the thing I've been testing for, it's over 15 years now in testing every step along the way and making sure that I'm supporting my hypotheses and it still looks like brain inflammation, which it does. And now we're getting to the point where we need to run the clinical trials based on this idea that it's brain inflammation. So just to give a little more background, I believe the culprit, the immediate culprit are the microglia cells. And if you've seen some of my other talks, I've talked about these to varying degrees. These cells are in the brain. They are not in the body. They are only in the brain. Uh, the body should not have microglia. We do not see them down there. And they're responsible for all kinds of things in the brain, but one of the, their main roles are immune defense. And so microglia are handling if there's a bacterium or if there's a 
virus, they're handling that response. So they're typically in this resting state or quiescent state. That's what you want your microglia to look like. This is in a healthy individual, nothing wrong, their microglia look like this, but they can very rapidly adopt this activated state. We call it an M1 activated state. And when they're in this activated state, they pull in their, these processes, these long arms, and they become rounded and they pump out, this is the key part, they pump out tons of pro-inflammatory factors. And these are the things that make you feel horrible. There's a reason why it's actually designed to do that. The microglia pump out those pro-inflammatory cytokines and they make you feel horrible when you get sick. So it's a response to, have, to being ill and it is designed to make you rest and not do anything. It, it makes it almost impossible to exert yourself because your body needs to devote its resources to fighting off that infection. So it is designed to stop you in your tracks, make it hard to think, make it hard to do anything and create significant fatigue. And then when the infection is gone, they're supposed to go back, which can only takes a few seconds. They go back to that normal state. But what I think is happening in MECFS, as you probably heard me say before, if you've seen some of the other talks, is I think too many of the microglia cell, cells in MECFS are stuck on this on position. So they're continuously pumping out these pro-inflammatory factors and causing a basal level, kind of tonic level of fatigue. And then even worse is a lot of these are on a hair trigger. They're what we call primed or hypersensitized. And they're provoked by even a little bit of exertion or a little bit of provocation or a little bit of exercise. And then even more, the microglia get pushed over into the activated state and make the um, the experience even worse or create even worse symptoms. So the greater the exertion, the greater the provocation, the more microglia are in the pro-inflammatory state and the worse the person feels. So that's what I think is happening. Now, I do want to point out real quick that as you see down here, there is a good side to the microglia. I mean, they're very important. You can't get rid of them, but they actually have an anti-inflammatory state. Obviously in MECFS, I don't think they're in a pro-inflammatory state or an anti-inflammatory state, but if we could get them into that state, we could resolve a lot of the symptoms. So that's my goal with my treatments that I'm interested in testing. I want to get, give a treatment that can cross the blood brain barrier, hit these activated microglia and either push them back to the resting state or push them into the anti-inflammatory state. Either one of those could help uh, control the symptoms and, and perhaps correct the underlying problem. So I hope that's all good. That's the premise behind everything that I'm imaging and everything that I'm showing here. So let me tell you why I got so uh, obsessed with seeing MECFS. This right here is the real reason why I focused on this for now, probably the past seven years, I've been doing a lot of imaging. And this is why, you know, when I started fibromyalgia and MECFS about 12 years ago, I very quickly went to clinical trials. I did some initial projects to confirm to me that it was brain inflammation. And then I wanted to go straight to clinical trials. And it's because I thought I had a good hypothesis. I had a strong suspicion that MECFS was a brain inflammation disorder. What we need are these centrally active anti-inflammatories. So let's just go, let's run the clinical trials. The problem I ran into when I tried to get funding to run the clinical trials, I hit these brick walls. And what happened was I could get pilot funding from nonprofit organizations who were very generous in funding these ideas. Uh, for example, if you hear of low-dose naltrexone, that's probably because I was able to get pilot funding to test it primarily in fibromyalgia. So that was incredible. The problem is, is there was no path to develop it and test it in larger groups after that nonprofit um, kind of proof of concept funding. And so the trials never went anywhere. And it was because I couldn't get the large one to two million, three million dollar grants to run it in a large enough group to actually affect prescribing behavior from uh, physicians. And the same reason came up every single time. It was when I tried to submit a grant, they would say, this idea is really cool. We can see that this low dose naltrexone you're testing works. All that's good, but we want to see why it works. We want to know, we want you to show us that there's neuroinflammation. And when you give this drug, you're reducing the neuroinflammation. We want to see that before we commit millions of dollars into testing this in large groups. And I understand that there's nothing nefarious about that request. It's just the fact that 
90% of clinical trials fail in humans across different fields. That means if you run 100 clinical trials, 90 of those will fail. And that's a whole lot of wasted money. And so huge federal organizations like NIH are, are wary of giving lots of money to, um, to these clinical trials. And so it's very hard to get NIH funding and it's just a lot of money. It's the same thing with corporations. They're very reluctant to put in large amounts of money. They just wanna see what's going on. So that was the biggest barrier. The nonprofits like SolveME would take the chance with small pilot funding, but you needed groups to handle the kind of the big lifting to do the large clinical trials. So here's the answer right here. People wanna see the pathology. And I, about eight years ago, became convinced if we really wanna get the money behind these treatments tested for MECFS, we have to show people what's wrong and that will solve the problems. You know, the patients wanna see it, the physicians want to see it, the scientists, the policymakers, the funders, everyone wants to see, show me what's actually wrong. And so I devoted a lot of attention to, to showing that. I thought it was really important to getting everything uh, lined up to run these clinical trials. If we can see it, I think we have a better chance of beating it. And um, I'll give an example here. I mean, one of the first obvious implications of being able to see MECFS. This is not an MECFS patient, obviously, but this is neuroimaging. And I probably, without even saying anything, you can probably look at this image and know approximately what's wrong with this individual, right? It's pretty obvious when you have the right imaging tools that they have a pretty large tumor in the prefrontal cortex. And so if this person comes to you and says, I'm having trouble uh, thinking, I'm having mood issues and cognition issues, there's something wrong. And then you do this scan and you find this huge tumor in the prefrontal cortex. No one is going to disbelieve you when you complain about your symptoms. No one's going to look at this and say, yeah, I think you're being whiny. I think you, everyone feels bad when they get older. They're going to say, you've got this huge tumor. This is the problem. We need to take care of this. So being able to see it, yeah, um, plays a strong role in how and how serious the disease can be taken and, and what you do about it. So you first of all, you get more um, people believe the condition more, and I think that is an important part. And then if we can see the target, as scientists, we know what to target. Uh, we know what to develop to attack this. And then we can see if the treatments work. So we can see if it shrinks or if it's inflammation, if it gets better. So there's all sorts of reasons why we want to be able to see it. There's a lot of things where we can't, but the question is, is can we actually see it in MECFS? If you could go into a clinic, do a scan, and then the physician can hold a piece of paper or a screen and say, yep, here it is, here's your fatigue, that would go a long way to us being able to tackle the problem. So that's the, that's the premise and why I spent so much time doing imaging work. This is totally real. We know what the microglia look like when they are abnormally activated. We know that if they look like the microglia on the left, they're normal. If they look like the ones on the right, they have been activated in an inflammatory way. And these are the cells that are causing the problem. This is just magnified cells. We can see them. The problem is, is we can't see them in humans. We can even see them change from resting to activated. So we can see the process. And as scientists who do basic science work can look at this. Now, these are usually rodent cells that they have to isolate to show this because you can't image this in a living human through the skull. We, there's just no technology that allows us to do that. So we know what we're looking for. The question is, is how do we actually image that in a living human? And that's been my goal. And so if I'm talking to someone with MECFS, I know that I'm looking at someone who has a lot of microglia cells that look like this. But, but how do I actually show that? That's been the objective. You know, to, to do this right here in a human, you would have to cut a hole in the skull, take out brain tissue, and then isolate it and image it. And even then, microglia are so sensitive, the process of taking them out of the brain would probably activate them all anyway. So I don't see any way to do this in humans. So we have to find the next best thing. So this right here is the next best thing, neuroimaging. That's why we spend, I think, gosh, right now, about 80% of our work is neuroimaging, brain imaging, for this reason. 
So two technologies we use, we use magnetic resonance imaging. This is an MRI scanner and that uses radio frequency pulses and a big magnet to get its images. And then we do positron emission tomography or PET and that uses uh, radio ligands that emit photons that allow us to make the images. So I'm gonna talk about those three approaches I mentioned. I'll start the first one. Let's talk about brain thermometry first because that was the original imaging that I developed specifically for MACFS. So these are the actual vessels of the brain. The, the brain's blood system or vessel system serves every single region of your brain. All parts of the brain need to have a continuous supply of blood. The brain generates more heat than any other place in your body. And that's because it's the most active site. It uses the most glucose and the skull traps in the heat. And so your brain runs a little bit hotter than your body. So if your body is running at 98.6 Fahrenheit, your brain will look maybe half a degree higher than that, or maybe a little less. So maybe it'll be up to, instead of 98.6, 99. So a little bit warmer just because of that insulation effect. But generally, in fact, almost always, your brain temperature and body temperature move with each other. And so your brain temperature is approximately what your body temperature is. And that's because it's the blood running from the body up through the carotids through the brain that are actually cooling down the brain and keeping them the same temperature. So that's what we expect in healthy individuals. But what we're finding in MECFS is there is a decoupling of their brain temperature from their core temperature, their body temperature. And I think that has something to do with the pathology. Basically, people with MECFS have a hot brain. It's hotter than it should be. It's it's instead of it being 99 Fahrenheit, it's something more like 100 or maybe even 101. And that definitely is hot enough to cause the symptoms of MECFS. So we have this technique that allows us to look at brain temperature th throughout the entire brain, which is a really powerful way of determining very quickly whether someone has a, a hot brain, a, a hyperthermic brain or not. This is the range that we're looking at. So the brain has to be in a very limited range of temperatures. It just takes very little for things to be pathological in the brain. It needs to be within kind of a two degree Fahrenheit range. So maybe 97.5 to 99.5, and then everything's okay, which is why I have it in green. If you start to get above 100 Fahrenheit, you're gonna feel it. You'll feel sick, you'll have symptoms like being mildly sick. And as you get to 102, you're gonna feel even worse. And as you get closer to 104, you're not gonna be able to do anything. So if you ever had a flu or, you know, obviously if you had uh, COVID and you could not do anything, you were completely hit by a truck, could do nothing, there's a good chance your brain temperature was, was 102 or higher. And that was what was causing that feeling. So of course, if your brain gets too hot, gets above 104, it can actually cause damage. Or if it gets colder than 95, your brain can shut down. So there are medical emergencies. However, I do wanna say that I've never seen that in any CFS. Um, I've only seen temperatures above 103 in one traumatic brain injury patient with, with acute uh, inflammation. But we don't see that in the MACFS. So we're not talking about temperatures 104. From what I can see, MECFS participants have temperatures between 99.5 and 102. So it's not dangerous to the tissue, it's, but it's enough to make you feel horrible, really sick basically all the time. So you basically feel sick, even though your nose may not be running, you may not have a scratchy throat, you still have all those uh, experiences of being sick because those are generated by that inflammation in the brain. This is what the scan looks like. This is actually an older one, one of the first ones I did, but the ones we do now look just the same. They're in 3D, we can go anywhere in the brain. So I can put someone in the scanner, a single individual. If you're saying, I think I've got an inflamed brain, I have these symptoms, no one knows what's going on. We can stick you in a scanner, run you, and we can say, yep, your temperature is normal or something's wrong with your brain temperature, it's too hot. This is an example of someone kind of mildly elevated brain temperature in the core. It's about almost 101. So this is a person who would feel, you know, some mild to moderate symptoms of feeling sick. Now, this is actually from the Ramsey Award uh, via Solve ME. And this is some of the original data that allowed us to do 
of the NIH study that we're running right now. So we originally did this in 15 people with MECFS. Now we're doing it on over 100, and we're a good way through that. And so we will be later this year putting out a much larger version, confirming or testing, and if true, confirming that most MECFS participants have elevated brain temperature, and that's going to be really helpful for the field. So real quick before I move on to the other technologies, what makes your brain hot? Why in the world would your brain be 102 Fahrenheit? Of course, I think that in most cases of MECFS, it's due to inflammation. The basic idea is that when your microglia are in that activated state, they are very hyperactive and they are driving up and generating heat and demanding more blood, more oxygen, more glucose and creating more heat then the circulating blood can cool down. So you get a buildup of heat in the brain. It gets again trapped by the skull. It can't be cooled off sufficiently. And so you, you have that temperature climb up. There are a couple of other possibilities, but I think that's generally what's going on. So we think it's just a hot brain because of the microglia, because of the uh, inflammation. Now, some other things we have to rule out real quick. Um, number one, if we're gonna measure your brain temperature, we have to measure your body temperature because if, if you have a fever, and your body temperature is 102, your brain has to be hot as well because your brain can never be cooler than your body. So we have to rule that out first. If, if you have a fever, that's the first problem to take care of. So we have to isolate that, but that's easy, just a ear temperature thermometer, um, just an oral thermometer, all those would work just fine. So we have to rule that out. The next, the next thing is, let's see, I think I can probably show that better. Yeah, maybe here. So the next problem is if you don't have enough blood reaching all of your brain, you can have a buildup of heat because there's something wrong with your vessels. There could be damage to the vessels or there may be something wrong with how they're being controlled and they're not letting enough blood flow through. And we call that hypoperfusion. So it's called cerebral perfusion. And we can measure that with a scan called arterial spin labeling. And so if you don't have enough oxygen or enough blood reaching all your brain, aspects of your brain, you will not be able to think, you will not be able to function. And so I think inadequate blood supply to the brain can look like MECFS. It can look like neuroinflammation, but it's a totally different problem. And so we have this really cool scan called arterial spin labeling, where we can, in, we can excite the blood in the carotids before they get to the brain, which tags them with their little radio frequency pulse. And then we can watch them flow through the brain. And then we can calculate how fast blood moves to the brain. And we know that we expect you to have 50 mil of blood run through every kind of 100 gram square of the brain every minute. And so we know how much you should get. So we know if you're hyperperfused and we know if you're hypoperfused. And in some people, this is what's wrong with them for sure. And we do see that sometimes there's a problem with perfusion and I would not call them MECFS. They have a perfusion issue that needs to be addressed. This is what it looks like if it's hyperperfused. This means there's way too much blood going to this region. And this means there's a seizure there that's causing the symptoms, but they can be hyperperfused as well. And that means there's not enough. And uh, in that case, they just wouldn't be able to think clearly and uh, they may have some mood issues and some perceptual issues and sensory issues. So we have to rule that out. In our studies, maybe one or two out of every 20, so I'd say maybe 10% seem to have a cerebral perfusion problem that needs to be investigated. But most people with MECFS, when they do our perfusion scan, they look totally normal. I do want to give one caveat because I know, depending on who's in the audience, I know some people would know an obvious caveat to that. And that is when you do MRI, you're always laying down on a bed. And I know that uh, some ish people have issues that are triggered by their orthostatic um, posture. So POTS, obviously postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, it may be sitting up or standing up that actually drives the problem in the blood vessels that cause the symptoms. We can't test that with uh, the scan, any MRI scanner you go to anywhere, you lay down. And so that's a, that's a potential problem. Now, I think a lot of the people who do our studies have already gone through uh, those tests. And I think that most people with MECFS do not have POTS. They do not have an orthostatic problem, but some of them do. And that's something that has to be ruled out. So one thing to keep in mind. And the last thing before I go on to the next thing is um, 
There's other reasons you may have a hot brain that's completely different pathology. If you have a tumor, that's going to build up heat. And if you have a traumatic brain injury, that'll cause inflammation and that'll cause a buildup of heat. And these would not be considered NECFS. Those just kind of mimic it sometimes, but it needs to be addressed in a different way. So that's the brain temperature. And uh, I do like talking about treatment. So one treatment thing, and because I'm sure some of you are thinking the same way I do when I talk about a hot inflamed brain, which is, can we cool it down? And I think it's a really cool question. I'm, I'm interested in doing that at some point just to see if it works, because I actually do think if you can cool the brain down a couple of degrees Fahrenheit, you will make the person feel better while you're cooling down the brain. Um, brain cooling is actually used a lot in pediatrics uh, in neonates who have uh, elevated brain temperature at birth. And then they're used in um, professional sports like uh, American football. You'll get concussions and you can get an acute elevation of brain temperature and cooling down the brain is essential to survival and to preventing long-term damage. And so it's a very important technique is cooling down the brain. It's kind of tricky to do though. You might think it's just a matter you can just take a cold towel and put it on your head. And unfortunately that doesn't work really well because it doesn't get through the skull. It's just not effective. And also because your blood and the temperature is being dictated by the blood running through the carotid. So you actually have to cool down the blood as it goes up to the brain. And so the professional devices are very expensive. I'm not gonna show any because I don't like to support particular companies and I haven't tested them myself. So I'm not gonna show you one, but you can imagine it's a big device that uh, circulates coolant that goes through tubes and you put the cap on your head and then you wrap little arms around your neck and then it keeps that flowing and cools down the blood and cools down your brain a couple of degrees. And that's really effective for that. Now, in terms of would this work for MECFS, Again, I'm guessing it would work acutely. The problem is, would it require you to keep it on all the time? That I don't know. And if that was the case, that seems pretty impractical, unless we came up with a, a different technique for cooling down the brain. Uh, well, you can't drag around these huge devices. Uh, that's, that's not going to happen. But it would be good to know if it works. And if it did, that would, if we were thinking about it, we could create other ways to get the brain cool other than having these big gigantic devices. So anyway, I think is a cool angle to pursue with all the elevated brain temperature I'm seeing. It would be nice to at least do a, a pilot and see if uh, reducing brain temperature works. Let's go on to the next one. So that was brain temperature. Let's go on to number two, which is tracking these leukocytes. Uh, this is an epic story that I can't even go through all the details. It is a long, long story as intrigue and mystery and heartache. Uh, this is something that had never been done in humans before. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the brief version. I'm gonna leave out all the, all the, probably the most exciting stuff, but we don't have time to go through all the details. I'll give you the overall story. So when I came to UAB, so we're talking about about seven years ago, at that point, I was already, completely convinced that MECFS was brain inflammation. But by that point, I had a, a further hypothesis, which was not only is the brain inflamed, but I think I know why. And it's because T cells and B cells from the body were penetrating the blood brain barrier and winding up in the brain where they are not supposed to be. So T cells and B cells are your peripheral immune response or part of it. Very important cells, but they should not be in your brain. They do not know how to handle the brain environment. And there was some evidence, indirect evidence, that T cells and B cells were causing this inflammation. Some of the indirect evidence was that if you deplete B cells with drugs, you can improve some people's symptoms. So that's just one, but there's a lot more to it. But I was thinking, this is what's going on. These T cells, B cells are infiltrating and that would be very bad. So if we could find leukocytes in the brain, we would have a really good clue of what's going on in MECFS. So I decided I have to find a way to measure this. Really quick, what that would look like is this is a blood vessel in the brain, and this is your this is a monocyte. We'll call it a leukocyte, a T cell or a B cell. They're circulating, but they can attach to the wall and squeeze through the gaps under particular uh, parameters. It won't go over that part, but the short story is these T cells, B cells can infiltrate the brain. Sometimes they're assisted by something. They've got an accomplish, uh, accomplice on the inside, and sometimes they're pushing their own way through. Either way, 
if these were in the brain, that would be a tremendous problem. So we need to check and make sure that they're not there. The problem is, is when I went to everyone, I went to everyone I could think of who works in this area to find a way to look at this in humans. I was, so I went to someone who did animal stuff. Was, how, how do we image leukocytes that are in the brain? How do we see them? How do we tag them? They're, they're too small to use traditional imaging techniques. And so I'd go to everyone and, and say, oh yeah, okay, we can do that. Um, you mean in rats, right? And I'm like, no, no, no. I want to do that in humans. And they'd say, humans? No, that, that can't be done. Everywhere I went, there's no technique. And it's true that there was no technique I could find. And I went to everyone. And I spent about a year trying all kinds of different technologies. And I could not find something that was practical that could work. So then our, our new radio chemist, Susie Lappy, came to UAB. And I met with her. And I said, there has to be a way to image leukocytes inside the human brain. And she said, well, there might be a way. There's a thing called zirconium-89, and that is a radioisotope. So if you know about PET, it uses radioisotopes, and they're usually carbon-11. You'll see the C11 or fluorine-18. You'll see an F18, and that's almost all PET research. Those things last a couple of hours. That's what PET is. It, you do a scan, and it's out of your system very quickly. Zirconium-89 can be used as a PET radioligand or, or radiopharmaceutical, but it lasts for days. And that's what we needed because the animal research suggests that it takes about three days for leukocytes to penetrate the brain once they've been triggered to do so. And so the tr traditional PET radio um, isotopes wouldn't work. They would be out of your system way too fast. And so what she said is, this is what we can do. We can take zirconium-89, we can tag it with something called oxine. And then if we incubate leukocytes with that, the, the um, leukocytes will take up the ZR89 oxine and they will then be tagged. And if we put them back into the person, we can follow those cells wherever they go. So you draw blood out of your patient, isolate the leukocytes, T cells, B cells, incubate them with ZR89 oxine, re-inject it, wait a few days and see where the cells went. And if they went into the brain, we would see them up in the brain. As I suggested, um, that's, that's much easier said than done. Safety issues, tech issues, regulatory contracts. It took, I think, almost six years to get through anything. And remember, this is just to test it in the first human. But we finally did it. And um, if you haven't seen these, uh, here's the first images of, of our humans. Let me tell you. I think this is super exciting to me. The most exciting part is still to come, but this is really exciting when you're a researcher and you see and you're there for the first in-person study. These are where the leukocytes went. And basically what we're looking at, this is the whole body uh, scan, a PET scan, which or CT scan. What you can see is most of the leukocytes are staying in the blood supply, which is where they should go because this is a healthy person. FDA requires we run healthy people first. And it looks like it's around the heart and lungs because that's where most of your blood is. There's more blood going through the core than running through your extremities. So they stayed in the blood supply, in the vessels, and they didn't infiltrate the brain, which is exactly what we thought we would find. So it looked great. The immune cells behaved like they should. They didn't die, even though they all had this tracer in them. So it worked great. We tested at 24 hours and they stayed um, in the in the blood system in the vessels, and this is CT scans. Uh, one hour, twenty four hours, and even seventy two hours later, we could still use this tracer. So absolutely awesome. That means days later, we can still use this tracer to follow where those cells went. If you had an infection, say in your arm, all those cells would have gone there, and we would see that. If you had uh, abnormal inflammation in your brain, and the leukocytes were going there, we would see aggregation there. So. It's working perfectly. So we've run now four healthy controls. Again, it's very, very slow, but now we're done with the healthy controls for the FDA. I so wish I could have had the first MECFS participant because that's what's next. We're gonna get the first MECFS participant. We have not identified who's gonna do that, um, but we're gonna get our MECFS participant and they're gonna be the first patient to do this scan and we're gonna, that'll be the first test. We'll scan the brain and say, are the cells there, the tag cells, or are they not? And that'll be a huge test of the hypothesis. So when we do that, I will try to release that information uh, publicly uh, when I can. And I'm thinking it'll take 
It could be two months from now, maybe three, because again, it's going very slow to run that first one. But uh, I do want to well, show you- We would you... love to, to host you for, for that. Okay, that announcement. yeah, right. uh, we can do that. Yeah, would love to. It's going to be cool. I'll be really excited. I'll be sitting right there waiting for the images to, to come out. So uh, this is what we look like, uh, what it looks like in the brain. Let's see if I can run that. Yeah, oh, so what we're looking at here is this is a top view of the brain. I'm kind of going from the lower parts to the upper parts. And what you can see is there's, there's blood, which is the red. These are the labeled leukocytes all around the brain, but they're not inside the brain. So the cells are, are not in the brain. And that's what you see as you, as you continue to go up. So the brain has not been affected. The leukocytes stay in the blood supply in the sinuses, which is where you expect them the leukocytes rather, and nothing's in the brain. So again, I don't know if that image looks particularly exciting, but basically it's a brain that is clear of any leukocytes. Now that we've run four healthy controls, we know it's the same thing every time. So now it's when we bring in the MECFS, do we see something different? And that's gonna be the, the really big um, payoff for all this work if we see the signal. And that'll lead to, um, very quickly lead to new directions of treatment because there are ways to handle T cells and B cells um, repairing the blood brain barrier. There's other techniques. So we just need to show it. So let me show one more and then I want to talk a little bit about clinical trials and leave some time for some questions. The third approach is also PET. And instead of tracking the leukocytes, we want to tag the microglia the pathological microglia. So there's actually a way to inject a radiopharmaceutical that will not dock with microglia in their normal state, but will dock with them if they're in the activated inflammatory state, which is really cool. So if we give it to a healthy person, they should have a very low uptake in the brain of that radio ligand. If they have inflammatory microglia, they should have a lot uptake. And that would tell us that they have microglia mediated inflammation. And so that's our third major uh, imaging technique. So it's called DPA714, and it's basically an inflammation marker. So I think I have, yeah, so what you're going to see here is showing uh, the number of microglia in each region, region that's taking up this radial ligand. This is an example of someone with not a lot of evidence of inflammation. So it, it works very well. It's kind of a typical uptake. And so if this person had a lot of inflammation, you would be seeing a lot of red in this um, brain scan. It's moving up to the top. And so we can see in an individual, if someone has pathological inflammation, it would show up on the individual scan. So um, I wish I could get these in a 3D view. I, I will do next presentation, I'll have these in a 3D view that we can kind of go around and I can go to different regions and show you where there might be inflammation. But another very powerful technique. So we actually have these three techniques, they all can show us in a very objective way the inflammation. And, I don't know which one of these will ultimately be the best. But they're all, they all have a lot of potential. Okay, let me talk a little bit about clinical trials because I, I just really feel like I, I have to because I, I feel very strongly that we need to push more clinical trials. So I'm just gonna make a comment about that just really briefly. First of all, before I do that, don't forget about clinicaltrials.gov. Most Clinical, most agencies running clinical trials should register their trial with clinical trials. I don't think they're legally required to. In fact, I know they're not. So not every clinical trial is registered here, but I think they should be. Uh, there are exceptions, but it's the best one source to find those. So be sure to look and search and see if there's a clinical trial in your area and you may be able to participate. So don't forget about that. When I looked at it this morning, by my count, it looked like there's about just short of 20 true clinical trials for MECFS. I think it was about 17 that I think I did. It was a rough count, but I think I'm pretty close. Now, that's a lot better than it was five years ago. When I did it five years ago, I think there was six or seven, and that was not near enough. Now we're getting close to 20, and you can see some of the things being tested. They're mostly, um, there's some pharmaceutical, but mostly behavioral um, botanical, there, there, there's actually all kinds of things here. Not a lot of pharmaceuticals though, but, but a good diverse set of things being tested for MECFS. The issue is there's not enough. Having 15 or so, we need to be, at least we should be around 50, I think, 
if we really want to solve the problem very quickly. There's just two, most of these will fail. We, we know that and no matter what area you're testing, most clinical trials fail. And so we just need more to be able to find out what's going to be the home run. I think, I, don't, I guess it's not, um, I guess it's not frustrating. It's just the way it is. I typed in long COVID after I did this search and found these 17 or so clinical trials and long COVID, not COVID, long COVID has about 300 active clinical trials. Um, if I take out things that are kind of duplicates, it should, it's at least 250. And so there's, so for every one MECFS treatment study, clinical trial, there's at least 10 long COVID treatment studies. You probably know th there's just tons of money available, but what's really interesting to me is the approach that the scientists in long COVID are taking. They don't wanna wait to have really great basic science information. They're going forward full speed on the things they think would work. And I would really like to see us adopt that strategy. And there's a lot of overlap between MECFS and long COVID. It, there's very likely that treatments that work for one will help the other. So that's to another topic for discussion. We gotta keep that in mind, but we really need to adopt this strategy of pushing ahead, identifying our most optimistic or most um, promising treatments. We need to push forward and we need to test them right now and stop waiting for the perfect proof. We just need to go through with the clinical trials. I'll say a couple more things about that and then uh, I will, I'll wrap up so we can discuss. So I've shown this slide before, but these are, these are just in my area. These are anti-neuroinflammation. So I know of about 30 or 40 treatments I think could be promising and could be tested. So this is just a quick list. And there are other hypotheses for MECVS, and they have their own kind of short list of promising treatments. These on the left, I turn my pen, pen off. The ones on the left are things that you could test in humans right now. And, uh, I mentioned lotus naltrexone. There needs to be more lotus naltrexone research. It clearly helps some people considerably, and then other people it doesn't help at all. We need to figure out what that's about. Uh, dextro, let's see if I have, no, dextro naltrexone. So dextro naltrexone is a modification of lotus naltrexone that I think will be much more powerful because it's more selective for the microglia, and it doesn't touch the opioid system, which limits the dosage for naltrexone, I think it'll be much more effective than LDN, but it's never been used in humans. We need to do that. There's, and then there's new forms of naltrexone and alternatives that could work even better. So there's tons of pharmaceuticals, can't go into details with that now. Then there's many, many agents that look great to me. They hit the target, but they've never been used in humans. So we have to do that, that extra step of getting it safely tested in humans. And then there's botanicals. And we're not, right now we're doing a large clinical trial for curcumin, stinging nettle, and resveratrol that are central anti-inflammatories. There's tons of botanicals that need to be tested. In addition to that, you've got devices. In addition to the brain cooling, there's vagus nerve stimulation, which take microglia and put them in their anti-inflammatory state. There's so many things. We could easily have 50 clinical trials and be testing really uh, cool potential treatments. A couple more slides and then I'm done. Um, what I think are the urgent funding needs, we have to keep all the mechanistic stuff that's going on. We should continue it. But as you hear me saying, we need to add a lot of clinical trials on top of that. I think we need to um, adopt that, that kind of approach with the long COVID community and just identify, prioritize, and start testing these clinical trials, testing these treatments. What you generally need are pilot funds of about 25,000 to 50,000. That's to test it on a small group, just to see if there's promise, if there's any signal there. And then after that, you need about, you, have, you need kind of mid-level funding around 200,000, 300,000 to test it on a slightly larger group. And if those both look good, you can go into a full clinical trial that could be 1.5 million or two. And that would be the large, uh, large size clinical trial that can influence prescribing behavior and actually get it into the hands of uh, patients. And so I think we need funding for all of those. And that's not all for industry to do. Some of that I think is the role of uh, federal governments, but uh, we need to work on making sure that we can do clinical trials for MECFS through NIH, for example, as well. And then the last thing I wanna mention is uh, I think 
if we really want to do this in the most efficient way, I would love to see a dedicated clinical trial center for MECFS where that is all they do and it is the experts in running clinical trials because most researchers are not clinical trialists. And so they may have a good idea of a treatment, but they don't run human clinical trials. And I really think we need a center ultimately that would do this uh, day after day that can run 10 plus clinical trials at once, run it quickly and say, nope, that didn't work. Nope, that didn't work. But this one did. And then we can take that forward. And those would probably take cost about 4 million probably to get going. So it's a lot of money, but you know, given the scope of the problem and money given in other areas, it's not that much to actually get something like this started. So that's my ideas with that. And the last thing I want to mention on that is this idea of decentralized clinical trials. So we're running uh, DCTs now, which means instead of requiring you to be right next to my institution, you can participate from anywhere in the United States. And so we, we have a goal for illness study where you can participate from your house. You don't have to come to UAB because really after your three hours drive away from my institution, it's too far to do our clinical trials. So this decentralized clinical trial, I think you're going to hear more about that. So if you see that, consider it. Um, some treatments, you can't do that because they're too risky, but if they're safe, we can theoretically get to anyone in the United States. So I am a big fan of that. Last thing is how you can help. I think you know the general ways of spreading news and getting other people invested. I just want to mention that the nonprofit funding is, is critically important. For a researcher, the main reason is that nonprofits are willing to fund the novel, risky new ideas that um, the more established federal government, huge, huge things, billions of dollars, they're usually not willing to take that chance. They want to see preliminary data. And just like how I turned the Ramsey grant into a large NIH grant, it's the nonprofits that give that initial funds to test it out. And then you can get larger NIH funding after you've generated that pilot stuff. So I do wanna mention that. I do wanna say really quickly, if you can participate in MECFS research of any type, also clinical trials, if there's one around you and you can participate, that is what a lot of this work is, is driven by, is participants willing to participate. So if you're able to take a look around you and see if there's something you can get involved in. And uh, the last one, and then I'm done. Uh, I don't know why, I don't know exactly why I threw this in here. I think I know why I have to explain it. You know, if you're interested in the science and you're interested in MECFS, you know, talk to the PIs, the established PIs and, and try to get into the field. We need more help. Uh, my lab, I think I have three open positions for neuroimagers and expert clinical trial managers. So you can certainly let me know if you're interested and you have skills in doing those kind of high level tasks. And I know my colleagues are in the same position. Um, the, there's fewer scientists doing these things after the shutdowns and after uh, kind of the COVID pandemic and, and all the lockdowns associated with that. And so we're all looking for more expert help. And so even if you don't see a job ad, um, contact the PIs and see if there's something coming up because most places I know of, they are looking for more help. So that's a different way to help. So that is, uh, I better stop so we can get to some questions, but everything's going forward. We got a, tons of stuff. There will be a lot happening in the second half of this year and we'll get that information out as we develop it. So thank you. Dr. Younger, this was fantastic. Really uh, appreciate a, uh, a really a wonderful presentation that describes the challenges and really how you overcome them. And, and really, uh, are you leaving us with a lot of uh, hope for, for the next steps? And uh, I think uh, I'd like just to, to start by saying that uh, I think you, uh, you presented a challenge to all of us. How can we get beyond those, uh, those first steps. And so we're gonna be committing to, uh, to find ways to work uh, hmm. with you and others to go beyond uh, just the, uh, the early stage uh, uh, studies and trials and, and go beyond that. So we're gonna talk more about that. Uh, there are a lot of questions that came uh, hmm. in. Maybe I'll try to summarize a few and, uh, um, and ask you in a more general way, you described a way that could be used as a diagnostic. Um, and so a couple of questions related to that. Uh, if you do an MRI scan and you don't find uh, those microglia changes, but the person comes in with a di diagnosis of, or symptoms of MECFS, what would be your conclusion that the diagnosis was, uh, was different or something else is going on? How, do you, how would you approach that? 
Yeah, we, do, we don't know that every single person that has MECFS will show this. I know they, they tend to, if they didn't have the signs of inflammation, I would be going through that list that I was talking about. I would be making sure there's not a perfusion. I would basically be checking, have you seen an autonomic physician who can test your autonomic nervous system? And I would go through and look at those other possibilities for those symptoms. If it's not inflammation, I can't say that they wouldn't be MECFS, but um, it, it, if, we, if they don't show up on those scans, that means they don't have the neuroinflammation. So it's something else. And if it's not vascular, there's only a few other things it could be. So I would be recommending other physicians. If it was one of my participants, other physicians they should check in with. And I would guess uh, what's, I would try to figure out a few other causes of that that are most likely in their case. Right. And um, thinking about making uh, a, a, a diagnostic test more accessible, obviously, I mean, you, you presented it so elegantly, so it sounds like MRI is, you know, is, is, a, is a simple test, uh, but it's just a question of accessibility. Mm. Are there any other ways you're looking at to perhaps uh, find surrogate um, markers, things that would go along with your MRI finding, but that could be done, you know, from a blood test or different ways yeah. so that you don't have to... Uh, get an MRI. Um, what are what are the things that you're looking at, and uh, what is the possibility of developing something like that? Yeah, I don't have one identified right now, but you're absolutely right. We always try to get funding to run to collect plasma and serum on all the participants. Which, after we conclude the study, we will do batch assays on them for all kinds of things that are my best guesses of a blood-based surrogate for the imaging, for exactly the reason you say. So, uh, for example, we're doing so now we have about 70 people that run the brain, th brain thermometry for the NIH study. So at some point, we're going to run those and run interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha and a few more esoteric things and things that may be indicators of microglia. We'll run those and then see if they correlate with the imaging stuff. So yeah, absolutely. I don't have any answers for that right now, but yes, we'll test stuff in the blood. There are ways to test for correlations with the imaging stuff. And if, yeah, if we found something that gave the same information as the brain scan, awesome. I mean, that would most certainly be considerably easier for the clinicians. The uh, TSPO, the last one is used in a lot of regions, but that leukocyte tracking, that's a pretty complicated one. And so that would be really tough to get going in a lot of different locations. So that would be great to have a peripheral thing. So definitely something we're following. Right. right. Um, Something that came up in a, in a number of questions, uh, um, and, and you mentioned that there's a lot of scientific work on, on long COVID right now. Uh, has any of your findings been replicated uh, in long COVID? Uh, do, we, do we see uh, either changes in temperature or, or uh, inflammation in the brain uh, in long COVID? Uh, there was some reports that uh, initially that maybe uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 itself could be found in the brain. That doesn't look like... Uh, that's hmm. the case, at least in most cases. But uh, is there anything uh, coming from that uh, that research that uh, that informs your yeah. your work? I don't think the scans that I use in particular have been tested in long COVID. So we're actually going to do that ourselves. So I didn't mention it, but we're actually uh, one of my graduate students, Indonesia, is running a very small uh, long COVID uh, group with all of our scans. So there's going to be with John McConathy, who's a radiologist here, we're going to be doing that uh, microglia tagging thing I showed you in long COVID. And we're, we already have funding to do that. And then we've got the brain thermometry and a few other things, lactate and stuff we measure in the brain in straight long COVID. People who do not have any CFS, it started with their COVID experience. So I guess the real answers will come as soon as we get those people run. Those are both active projects and when we collect it, we'll test it out. But I have not read something that uses my scans outside of this group. So I, so I don't know. Well, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time, and this has been so stimulating and, uh, and informative. Uh, so we would love to, uh, 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 to host you again. Uh, maybe when there are some of the, uh, the initial findings that, yeah. uh, that you were talking about, there are many other questions. We'll try to, uh, to get to, uh, to some of the, uh, the questions perhaps um, uh, offline. And uh, I know there's yeah. a lot more, more interest, so uh, we'll try to address some of those questions uh, in a future time. And really wanted to uh, to thank you for this wonderful uh, wonderful presentation, and uh, uh, we look forward to to hearing more from you uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much.